Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Bible Baptist Church. Glad to have you here. Uh, those, those who are in the back can make their way in, and we welcome you that are online. Let's all stand today, and we are going to open our service in prayer. And I'm going to have Dave Osenbach come and lead us. Thanks. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful morning, Lord. We thank you for all of your creation, Lord. We thank you for your, your many blessings, your endless supply, Lord. We ask that you would be with us this morning, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to your word. Be with Pastor. Give him clarity of speech, Lord, and uh, help us to apply those things, Lord, in our lives which you would deem important. We ask this in your precious name, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, let's turn to hymn 143, Be Thou My Vision, hymn 143. Just a couple of announcements this this morning. Uh, Our 9.30 a.m. Bible study beginning October 3rd will be a study of the Sermon on the Mount. So uh, uh, October 3rd, come here for that, uh, uh, those uh, teachings. And uh, please uh, keep Skip Smith in prayer. Uh, He's still waiting on a kidney donor and uh, we are asking people to consider donating a kidney. So uh, I'm not sure what his status is beyond that, but uh, keep him in, keep skip, uh, skip in prayer. Uh, let's uh, pray for the offering, and uh, we'll pray for the offertory, and then give your offering. Dear Lord, we just thank you that uh, you you provide everything for us, Lord. We ask us to be wise with the spending and and all that in, entails for the uh, furtherance of this church, Lord. Guide us and protect us, Lord. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen.
you are pressing on to higher ground. I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 73 for our scripture reading, Psalm 73. When you get there, I'll give you a minute to get there. Well, a minute's actually pretty long. When you get there, please stand for the reading of God's Word. And I'm going to read the first 19 verses of Psalm 73. Psalm 73, so when you get there, or when you're standing and you've opened your Bible, follow along as I read. Psalm 73, and I'm going to stop at verse 19 for time's sake, and then we'll bow in prayer while we're standing. It is a psalm of Asaph. It begins, truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain, Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, It was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment they're utterly consumed with terrors. May God bless his word. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for another blessing of a great week that you've given to us undeservedly. Uh, Lord, we have not earned it, and you're so good. And and now you're giving us another day. Your mercies are new every morning. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us to worship you today. Uh, Father, I know that your, your word tells us your eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show yourself strong to them whose heart is perfect toward you, and that you're not looking at our outward Uh, attire what we look like on the outside father you are looking at our hearts today and i pray that as god's people here in this place that what you see would be acceptable to your eyes and your heart Uh, lord that our hearts would be tuned in worship towards you surrendered bringing praise and glory and honor father minister your word to us today Um, minister to us through the singing that uh, our hearts and our souls would be knit together with you as we praise you and as we give. Father, everything we just pray would bring great glory and honor to you. And Father, I pray that you would enable us as a church to be the lighthouse that we need to be, that we would take our eyes off our own situations as the devil wants us to just focus on ourselves. And Father, help us to look out to a harvest that is plenteous, people that need Jesus Christ. And Father, help us to engage, help us to love people and share Christ with them. We ask your blessing today. We pray that even online, people would be tuning in and considering your claims and your your magnificence and especially the gospel. And we ask your blessing now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. All right, let's take our hymnals once again. We'll turn to hymn 549, Like a River Glorious, hymn 549. Like. 
you back tonight. We have our evening service, totally different ser- uh, service, different message, different songs, same people. Sorry about that. But um, it starts at six o'clock. We're going through the, the book of First Se- John. Where are we? First John. And tonight we are in chapter two, getting towards the end of chapter two. Uh, and we're going to talk tonight about abiding in him. That's a big theme in the few verses we're going to looking at look at tonight. Uh, and Hopefully you are, as a believer, hopefully you are abiding in Christ. Everything stands or falls on that idea. But I want you to take your Bibles now and turn to Psalm 73. I have been um, thinking about and reading about a particular man who uh, wrote books. I mentioned him maybe last Sunday or the Sunday before that. And I'm going to follow up on it because the more I've been thinking about this guy, this is a a man that is billed as a New Testament scholar and um, has a very interesting story. And the more I've been thinking about him, and of course I preached at the PRBC on Monday night and I mentioned the same same author and that's got me thinking about it. Uh, And and the more I think about this guy, I, I realize that so many people in quote-unquote Christendom are like this man. Uh, And some even grow up in our churches. Some even pastor our churches and then leave the faith. And of course, not of course, you probably, maybe you've never heard of Bart Ehrman, 
but he is, a, he is noted as a New Testament scholar. He has written many books. And uh, his own testimony is that he grew up in uh, fundamental evangelical. He was actually a pastor of a Baptist church. And um, so we're going to talk about that. But I don't want to do, really what I want to do is because the Lord keeps me, bringing me back to Asaph. In Psalm 73, Asaph really goes through certain parallels to the life of Bart Ehrman and other people. And so we're going to look tonight, or this morning rather, at Asaph, who wrote 12 psalms. His first psalm was Psalm 50, and then this is the second psalm that he wrote, and then the next 11 psalms. So from 73 and the next 11 psalms uh, are all written by Asaph. And so we're going to look at this psalm specific, specifically, Atlantically, no, specifically, we're going to look at um, what Asaph went through, how, how we've all gone through it to some degree or another. Basically, in fact, uh, Psalm 73 really parallels the book of Job, where Asaph is a believer in Jehovah God and understands God as he has revealed himself. But then for a time, he takes his eyes off of what he knows and he looks around him and he sees the wicked prosper. He sees bad people seemingly getting away with it and having a high old time. Meanwhile, he and his compatriots... I don't know if that actually fits there, but his friends uh, are experiencing just the opposite. I mean, he's, he and his fellow Jews are, are trying to live for God, and it just it doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem fair. And so he almost slips, but he doesn't. And we're going to look at this. We're going to, I'm using Bart Ehrman as an example. I'm going to read some of his quotes from a book. In fact, the title of my message today is, a, is one of Bart Ehrman's books. It came out in 2008, and it's called God's Problem. Did you know that God has a problem? Actually, let me, let me say it the way the title of my message is. God's Problem? You notice my inflection on the voice? That means it's a question. God, he's saying God has a problem. And I submit to you, God doesn't have a problem. Man does. But we are going to look at that, and we're going to look at it all from Psalm 73 as Asaph shares his experience. First, let's bow together in prayer, and then we're going to jump right in. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this precious congregation that is gathered together in this place. We're grateful, Father, for all Bible-believing churches across America that are worshiping you and studying your word and with the view of worshiping and glorifying you and serving you and obeying your word. And Father, we're, we're just sinners saved by grace. We're so thankful for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, we, would never, we were never worthy of it when we got saved, nor could we ever be. And maybe there's some that are listening and tuning in today that have yet to experience the new birth. And I pray that the Spirit of God would illuminate their mind, that they would, their eyes would be opened to the glorious light of the gospel, that they would be saved. Father, we thank you that whosoever will may come. We ask you, Lord, to bless and draw people to yourself and help us. Encourage the flock. And Father, help us to not get distracted. Uh, help us to take our eyes off of people uh, because they, they, it leads us down the wrong road. Help us to learn the lesson that Asaph learned. And we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. I have preached this psalm before, and at least twice that I know of. I've probably referred to it quite a lot, because this psalm has made a big impact on me uh, from, when, from when my pastor preached it many years ago. I uh, just opened my eyes. I, I felt a kinship to Asaph. But every time that I've preached this text, I've always gone to verse 1 and said, okay, now this, this is what Asaph learned from the experience of Psalm 73, but he didn't believe it in the beginning. 
Because look at verse 2. It's, it's a contrast. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slept, slipped. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And so I've gone through this several times. And again, I've articulated that he didn't always believe that. And, and of course, then we work our way through the psalm where he ends up believing that. But you know, the more I study the life of Asaph, the more I've come to realize that he knew from the beginning that God was good. Just like you, if you're a professing Bible believer, and you understand and you've studied the revelation of Scripture, that you believe that too. And so I'm convinced. You see, Asaph was a... I could say a music minister. We're going back to the Old Testament time. So he was, the, he was a choir director in David's temple. or In, in David's time, he was the, the music minister, led the choir. And then apparently his tenure, his time was so long that he even moved over into Solomon's time and, and was also the music leader then. So this man spent his life leading God's people in worship of Jehovah. And, and again, the more I study about it, I understand that, you know what, he knew how God revealed himself. And that's why he starts out in verse 1 the way he does. In fact, if you've been a believer any length of time, you probably believe the same thing up here. What's he said? Look at verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel. Okay, he was of Jew, and we're in the Old Testament economy here. But he said, truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. That was his... He knew that. He knew that God was good. He knew that he is revealed as a good God. And yet he still struggled. And... The more that dawned on me, the more it made me realize that, you know what? God's people can know certain truths up here. You know, we give mental assent to them, and yet sometimes we can struggle with the day-to-day feeling it. I know that's bad, you know. Who cares how we feel? That's true. But sometimes, and this is what Asaph did, sometimes we look around and we see the wicked prosper, we see all the unfairness in this world, and we struggle. And he says that. Again, he starts out, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But, as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious when I saw the, at the foolish, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Here's three things as we go through the psalm. First of all is the premise, that's verse 1, God is good. And we're just going to lay that out right now to remind you, and I'm, I doubt I'm going to get any resistance from you. I doubt any of you are going to say, whoa, wait a minute, no, no, I don't think God is good. We agree with Asaph on that. And it's, and, and it's good, he starts right out with that. So we're going to see the premise, God is good, then we're going to see the problem. What Bart Ehrman says is God's problem. What Asaph, for a time, thought might be God's problem, ends up not God's problem. Our problem. And then finally, we're going to see the preaching. I mean, everything that he unfolds in the first part of this this psalm is not good thinking, but sometimes we fall into that. And once he... Comes to verse 17. Don't look there. You're going to get the, you're going to get ahead. You're going to go ahead and find out where the answer is. But once he gets to verse 17, everything changes. And then he starts preaching the right stuff. Then he starts, okay, this is really God in the right way. Uh, so we're going to walk with Asaph through this. And again, he starts out in verse 1. Truly, God is good to Israel. And, and again, I want to affirm. That if you don't believe that, that in God's goodness, or if that, ha, if that thought has been shaken in your life 
probably because of circumstances. Maybe what's going on in our country or around the world, and you're starting to wonder, is God really good? I want to remind you what Asaph said, and which is the and what is the revelation of Scripture of God Himself. He is good. God is good. In fact, Psalm 107, verse 8, verse 15, verse 21, and verse 31 all say the same thing. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. That is the God of the Bible. That is the Creator. Oh, that men would praise Him. What would cause us to praise God? Seeing His goodness. His wonderful works to the praise of men. You get your eyes off that, you start doubting whether God is good. In fact, in Psalm 73, this first verse, Truly God is good to Israel. I read, I was reading that, that the Hebrew brings out this certain uniqueness to this idea to where it could be God is only good. Which reminds me, maybe that's where the songs, you know, the song came that Lynn and Leah sang. Uh, he is only always good. God is good all the time. As our Liberians say all the time, God is good. That's scriptural. God is only good. Sometimes we're challenged with that. Think of this. Remember in Luke chapter 11? Also, I believe it's in Mark, the parallel of this. Jesus is talking about prayer to believers. And he says, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Good question. Dads, if your son needs bread, which one of you are going to give him a stone instead? Don't raise your hands to be sarcastic, okay? Uh, I know some of you would, right? But no, of course you wouldn't. If your son is hungry and say, Dad, I need bread. Here, have a rock. Chew on this for a while. No dad's going to do this. Or if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? And the implied, implied answer is no. Or if he shall ask an egg, notice all things that are needed. If he asks an egg, will he give him a scorpion? And again, the answer is of course not. And Jesus said, if then, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? And then elsewhere, it's not limited to the Holy Spirit. The idea is this. If a dad knows how to give good things to his son, and of course he would not, if a son asks for something good, a, a, a dad that has natural affection it's not going to instead give them something bad. And Jesus says, now if that's the nature, you dads, you good-hearted dads that love your kids, if you would never give your child, your son, something harmful instead of something good, how much more? God's, God's on a different level. Because our God is good. Even more so. Would he act better than the best dad who has his son or child's best interests at heart? God is even far superior than that in goodness. That's Jesus saying, listen, God is only always good. And if you ask him for something, if he's going to withhold it, it's not because he's not good. It's not because he doesn't love you. There's a reason for it. Turn to, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 for a minute. The, um, the unbelieving world and the agnostic world, and, and I want to articulate that this man, Bart Ehrman, does not consider himself an atheist. He still hailed by many as a New Testament scholar, um, but he, he, he identifies himself as an agnostic. Now remember, an atheist, this goes to the Greek language, it's the word thea, theism, 
God, and then the word uh, atheist, means no God. So if you're an atheist, you don't believe there's a God. And by the way, let me tell you, based on Psalm 14 and 1, God doesn't believe in atheists. I love that saying. I love that. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So you think you're in, uh, you know, you're, you've exalted yourself that you don't believe in God. That's okay, Mr. Atheist. God doesn't believe in you. But then there's, there's, you know, a whole lot of people more and more that would identify as atheists. I don't believe in God. And by the way, God has created every one of us. He has created every human being that denies his existence. And he's put within them his law. And when somebody gets to the point, that's why the Bible isn't just insulting men saying, you know, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. It's telling us something has happened in someone's mind. And, and if we were to go in that direction, you know, folks, the Bible makes it very clear that people, people deny the existence of God because of the implications. If there is a holy God that created me, that I am answerable to. Well, that doesn't fit in too well with the lifestyle I've chosen. So many people become atheists because of of what it means or because they're bitter. Like Asaph or like other agnostics, they look at all that's going on around the world and they try to lay blame at God's feet. But an agnostic is someone who is willing to to say, okay, maybe there's a God. But here's what the agnostic believes. If there is a God, he's not made himself known to man. And that's why the word gnosis, gnostic, comes from the word knowledge in Greek, because the athe- or the agnostic says, is willing to say there may be a God, but we have no way of knowing who he is. The Christian, on the other hand, believes that there is a God and that he has made himself known to man in his word, the Holy Bible, and through his son, Jesus Christ. That's a Christian. Now, they love to to go on. Uh, Like Bart Ehrman, they look at pain, suffering in the world. They see wicked people seemingly have a good old time of it and, and the righteous people are struggling and suffering And they come to the conclusion that, in fact, many have even said, I refuse, I cannot in good conscience worship a monster. I I, I have a hard time just saying that. That's come from their lips and from their pens. They, They are charging God with foolishness. They're looking all around them, seeing all the pain, and they're saying, it's God's fault. He can't be loving. He can't be good. And so... They argue, wouldn't a father, wouldn't, here's what one, in fact, Bart Ehrman, I believe, said this, shouldn't a good father save his children undue pain? Now, you know where he's heading with that. Let's back up to Luke, in your mind, to what I just shared with you in Luke chapter 11. Shouldn't a good father spare or save his children undue pain? I'd say, yeah. Right? Now look at First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now remember, Peter is writing to Christians that are suffering persecution. Verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God, through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, now look at this next phrase, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Is God a good father who would save his children undue pain? I tell you, he is. The only time God allows pain is if he has a higher purpose for it. And that is what Bart Ehrman and so many people miss. 
if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. I mentioned the book of Job. Remember what happened with Job? He lost everything. In fact, in Job chapter 1, he declares this, and he wasn't done all his trials yet when you read chapter 2. But he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return thither. And then you remember his attitude? The Lord gave, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then I love this phrase after this. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. That's what so many people are doing today. Like a book, God's Problem, God, that God has a problem, I would call that charging God foolishly, and I'll explain a little from his book. How about another example? Remember Joseph? Joseph went through a lot of pain. I mean, severe pain. Betrayed by his brothers, forsaken by his family, thought he was dead from his father's, and then all, you know, falsely accused. One thing after another went wrong in Joseph's life. And man, he became bitter, didn't he? Remember when he had the opportunity to, to pay back his brothers? And he, he oh, wait a minute. He didn't pay back his brothers, did he? Remember that? When he could have. Power. Can you imagine anyone that had vengeance in Joseph's position? Oh, what a dangerous place to be. His brothers had done him wrong. Can you imagine if Joseph, all those years, after he was, he, first he was almost killed, except for the intervention of one brother, then he was sold into slavery and lived, had a life of hardship that unnecessary, the way we say that. Can you imagine if he was nursing a grudge the whole time against his brothers? And then finally, he becomes the number two most powerful man in Egypt. And his brothers have no food. Their father sends them, and they come crawling on the hands and knees. Can you imagine how Joseph could have milked and nursed his grudge and gotten the ultimate payback? And his brothers knew that. And when they found out that it was Joseph, after he played with them for a little while, you remember what Joseph's response was? Remember what you did to me? I will never forget it. <laughs> he paid back. No, he didn't do that. In fact, he comforted them. He said, fear not. Am I in the place of God? Whoa, what a powerful testimony. He said, as for you, you thought evil against me. He could have just parked there. Because that's where we park. When we become like Asaph. We just look at people, and we get bitter, and we get mad. But he said, but God meant it unto good. Whatever you're going through right now, Christian, whatever, God has a reason for it. And it's not bad. That might not feel good, but God means it for good. You've got to see that, or you will become like so many of these agnostics and atheists. And you'll be laying the blame at God's feet. By the way, listen to some of these. Talk about, talk about Bart Ehrman for a minute. He wrote other books besides God's Problem. Listen to some of these books. He wrote another book called How Jesus Became God. The Exaltation of a Jewish Preacher from Galilee. How Jesus Became God. Do you see a theological problem in that? Here's another one. Forge, forged. It's just called forged. Writing in the name of God. Why the Bible's authors are not who we think they are. Wow. Here's another one. Misquoting Jesus. The story behind who changed the Bible and why. Here's another one. Jesus interrupted. Revealing the hidden contradictions in the Bible and why we don't know about them. You know, when I hear all these books by Bart Ehrman, I think that he's being a good agnostic, right? What's an agnostic? Someone who doesn't believe that God has revealed himself. That's where many people fit today. People that have been through our doors in our church and walked with us for a while. No longer. They would probably be agnostics now, if not atheists. Every church has them. 
So let's look at Psalm 73. If you're not back there, turn back there. So Asaph, he knows God is good, but he, he gets his eyes off the Lord for a little while and he starts focusing on what's going on around him. And look what he says. Verse 3, beginning verse 3. Psalm 73, verse 3. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. In other words, nothing holds them back. There seems to be no restraints. They just do evil. They prosper doing wicked. And they quote unquote get away with it. Remember what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes? Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That's this. You know, people can get away with doing evil. It's... And I say that in quotes. He wasn't saying that in quotes. But he, was, he, he felt that. He's like, there, look again at verse 4. There are no bands in their death. Their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. Why is it that the wicked people are having an easy time of it, enjoying life with no problems and no regard for God, day after day after day. And this is where you and I say, it's not fair, right? We say it's not fair. They are corrupt, verse 8, speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, their tongue walketh through the earth. In other words, nothing holds them back from their slander and reviling God and everything good. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Again, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of men think God has left the earth. By the way, that's one of the definitions of an agnostic. You've heard of the divine clockmaker? There's people that don't want to totally dismiss God just in case he's really there. But they believe, okay, well then God must have wound up the thing, the world, and then, and then left and let it go on its way. So we're just kind of all on our own. That's another agnostic philosophy. And that's, in, in a sense, folks, Asaph had become a practical agnostic for a little while because he, he was struggling. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Now, folks, he's beating a drum, which he will soon renounce, thankfully. And you and I need to be very careful that we don't start beating that drum and continue to beat it. There's a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And you start looking at what's going on around, you start looking at things in the temporal, the here and now, you're going to come to some wrong conclusions. And that's what these are from Asaph. All these things he's saying are really refuting his first statement that God is good. And now, verse 13, all the first, first part of this text is all they. They, they, they. He's all looking at them. And now, as any, you know, the Bible says we dare not compare ourselves with those that commend themselves. They measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. And that's what he did. So first he's got his eyes focused on them. Then he talks about himself. He says in verse 13, Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and wash my hands in innocency. You ever felt that way? You know. And I've heard Christians draw. It's not worth it. Christian life's not worth it. It's not worth serving the Lord. That's what he was saying. He was having a pity party, folks. None of you have ever done that, have you? No. Nor me. Boop. <laughs> right? For all the day long. Have I, been, have I been plagued and chastened every morning? And then he says this, If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. In fact, this verse is one of the things that led me to realize and think through my interpretation of verse 1. 
He, had, he, he knew God was good, but he wasn't feeling it. And what he was feeling, he just expressed. But he knew. Now, he is a teacher. He's a leader in Israel. And if he were to dare voice these things, he would offend against the, children, the generation of thy children. He knew. He knew that he couldn't go in this direction. Verse 16, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. I want to remind you folks, Asaph is kind of burying his heart here, but he, and he, but he is burying his heart. Now, at this point, he's like, I can't share these feelings, but he, he would end up doing that, wouldn't he, in Psalm 73? It's like Paul. You remember in, um, in fact, let me turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, pretty sure it's 2 Corinthians, I'll find out in a second, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, if it's not 2 Corinthians... Okay, listen to what Paul said. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. He said, We would not have you, we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia. Paul, it, it, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant that it wasn't a bed of roses. I don't want you to be ignorant of our problems. Our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. You've heard me refer to this. I always misquoting it because I realized I had the word order wrong. But I've shared this so many times. We were pressed out of measure, above strength, inasmuch. That's the, the word that I didn't use because I didn't have this fully memorized. So it's inasmuch, inasmuch, inasmuch. Inasmuch that we despaired even of life. Paul. Paul, you're the great apostle. We are looking up to you. You are our spiritual leader. You're not supposed to share that stuff with us. We're not supposed to know that you have problems. You're supposed to say, oh, it's always blissful being a Christian and I just love every aspect of it. And it's so easy. Follow me. He doesn't do that. He says, in fact, he even says, we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning the trouble which came to us in Asia. We were pressed out of measure, above strength. How bad was it, Paul? We despaired even of life. Well, thanks, Paul. Now I'm really encouraged. Paul shared that because, folks, he had times where he was challenged. Asaph had times when he was challenged. You and I will have times when we are challenged. Especially when we get our eyes off the Lord, and that's basically what happened. Let's go back to Psalm 73 as we wrap it up here. Psalm 73. So he's sharing what he went through, sharing his wrong thinking, and then we, we see this beautiful word in verse 17. Until. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Let's fast this forward to New Testament times. Until I went to church. What, what happened when you go to the sanctuary? You worship God. You hear the scriptures. You're reminded you're the presence of God. He forgot all that. He wasn't thinking of scripture he wasn't thinking of God's revelation of himself. He just got his eyes off the Lord. And by the way, there's a lot of people probably, maybe even some watching this on Facebook that haven't been to church in years. Maybe this is their first time checking in on a church service. And that would describe them. They have been immersed in the world, looking at everything that's going around them, and they're exactly at the point of, of Asaph. Their feet are almost gone. Their steps had well nigh slipped. You need to get back to church, by the way. Get the right thinking. Hear the scriptures. Get things in perspective. That's what happened. When he went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Real quick, let me read to you from the book. And this is the blurb that promotes the book, God's Problem. In times, here's what from Bart Ehrman. 
He says, in times of questioning and despair, people often quote the Bible to provide answers. Surprisingly, though, the Bible does not have one answer, but many answers that often contradict one another. Consider these competing explanations for suffering put forth by various biblical writers. The prophets, their presentation of suffering. Suffering is punishment for sin. The book of Job, who offers two different answers. Suffering is a test, and you will be rewarded later for passing it. And then the second one is, suffering is beyond comprehension since we are just mere human beings, and after all, God is God. Ecclesiastes, suffering is the nature of things, so just accept it. All the apocalyptic texts in both Hebrew Bible and the New Testament God will eventually make right all things in this world that are wrong. You get that? He said that the New Testament, the Bible, doesn't just have one answer for suffering, but many, and they're often contradictory one to the other. Suffering's a punishment for sin. Suffering is a test. Suffering is beyond comprehension. Suffering is the nature of things. And God will eventually make it all right. He has a contradiction in that. When I read this, the more I thought about Bart Ehrman, I'm like, I, I started reading, I'm like, he, he doesn't have kids. He can't have kids. Because if he had kids, he would understand that there are times as a loving parent that you have to discipline. And if you have more than one kid, you know, you got all these different things. I thought, he can't have kids, and I looked it up, and he has a son and a daughter. So that threw that theory out. But I just, folks, that's not, they're not contradictions. God does allow suffering. Ultimately, it's not God's fault, it's our fault. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, therefore death passed upon all men. Don't forget that last part. Up to that point, we're all blaming Adam. That jerk. Oh, that, that confounded first man. But do you remember what it says at the end? Wherefore death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. You better be careful. You're not blaming Adam too much. Because you know what? You sin as well, and I do as well. But that's what brought the problem into the world, folks. Don't lay that at God's feet. The Bible says, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now, he allows it for a time. Like Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He is working all things together for good. And so, for a time... He is long-suffering. Oh, believe me, he's well aware of the injustices that are going on. Take comfort in that until you realize that that also applies to you. See, we're also people that need justice. He's aware of that. The Lord is not, the Lord is, um, not slack concerning his promise of coming back and making, setting things right. He's not Slack concerning that, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Folks, there is no contradiction when it comes to pain. And it's sad. Let me just read to you here. Um, Bart Ehrman's book, God's Problem, How the, pain, How the Problem of Pain Ruined My Faith. In 2008, it was a New York Times bestseller. He details the journey from Christianity to agnosticism because he could no longer believe in a Christian God that permitted his creation to suffer. By the way, he taught at Princeton Baptist Church in New Jersey. And I love that one. The more I thought on that. You remember what Princeton, we talked about Princeton Theological Seminary? Used to be a Bible-believing seminary. And you remember, I, I love this one, that the cemetery now is more spiritual than the seminary. Because in the cemetery, there's a lot of the old teachers that believe the Bible and taught the Bible, and they have scripture. There's more spiritual life in their cemetery than there is in their seminary. But isn't it interesting? 
as goes Princeton Theological Seminary, so went Princeton Baptist Church pastor. Believing the Bible, identified with fundamental evangelical Bible-believing Christians, and now he renounces all that. I close with this. Back in 1969, some guy from the South, um, Robert Cutshaw, Bob Cutshaw, he was a rock collector, and he had a he he just loved rocks, all kinds of rocks, and he had a little shack, little little story set up next to his house to sell his rocks. And one day he found this beautiful green, no blue, a blue rock, a very big rock. Ooh, it's pretty. That's what he said to the to the uh, interviewer. It, it was pretty. And um, so he, he put it in his rock, you know, he put it in his rock store and tried to sell it. He thought, man, if I can get a hundred bucks for that. And, uh, and it was there for a long time. This was in 1969 that he found this. And years and years, nobody ever even was interested. Nobody offered anything. And then he started, he started getting in financial trouble and he needed to pay his mortgage. I think it was either the rent or the mortgage and, and he's thinking, you know, that big rock might be worth something. I'm going to go get it appraised because, like, maybe I can get, like, $500 for it. And, and so they, he went and got it appraised. And uh, it ends up that it was a 2,111 carat blue sapphire that was worth millions of dollars. That's pretty. That is get, just got prettier, didn't it? That's pretty. And, and think about it. Here's this guy. He said, in fact, when he was interviewed after, he said, I almost, if somebody offered me like 100 bucks, I would have sold it. Oh, if I had known that, we would have taken a trip down south to this guy's rock store and bought it, wouldn't we? And then, of course, he had it cut. And as the guy was cutting it on the third day, it revealed this beautiful, uh, like what looked like the Star of David. So it's now known as the Star of David Sapphire. That's again worth millions of dollars. And when I thought of that story, I thought a lot of Bart Ehrman. Here's a guy that grows up as a Baptist preacher, believing the Bible, believing the New Testament. In fact, it was his love for the New Testament that that caused him to dig in. Uh, for, he went to Moody Bible School. I think it was Moody, and then another one. Then he started going to some liberal places where they started denying the Bible. But you know what? When I think of Bart Ehrman and I think of so many Christians that grew up in churches like this and now are atheists or agnostic, you know what I think? Just like Bart Ehrman, it was right under your nose. Right under your nose. Just like that gem. It sat there and for, for decades. This super expensive gem unpolished, uncut, sat in this guy's possession, and he didn't even know it. Right under his nose, Bart Ehrman grew up around the gospel, studying the gospels. Right under his nose, people come into this church and hear the gospel. It's right under their nose, and they miss it. How sad. No, God does not have a problem. Actually, man has a problem, and God intervened, became a man, and died on the cross so that our problem could be taken care of. That's what's missing from Bart Ehrman's life and many others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, we are grieved when we value this precious gospel as we do. We know that it is the power, your power, unto salvation to them that believe. We know, Father, that your gospel is a savor of life unto life. And yet so many hear it and don't get it. So many grow up around it and and no longer value it or or don't see the value of it. And for some, Father, like Bart Ehrman, walk away from the faith charging you with foolishness. Thank you, Father, for Job. Thank you for Joseph. Thank you for the many that have understood like Asaph. And and though they struggle at times, Father, they were steadfast in their commitment that God is good. 
to Israel and to such as are of a pure heart. So, Father, help us to have a pure heart. Father, there may be some folks listening, even some here, that have never bowed the knee to Jesus Christ. They've never surrendered. They've never been born again. They've never seen themselves as sinners. They've never taken responsibility for their own sin. And they're just pointing fingers at everyone else. Father, my prayer is that you would open eyes of those who believe not, that the glorious light of the gospel would shine in, and for the first time maybe they would see themselves as guilty. And Father, I pray that as condemned sinners, those who hear my voice or those in this room that have yet to be born again, as condemned sinners, they would justify you and and say that you are right and they were sinners. And then, Father, that they would acknowledge the cure of Jesus Christ coming to this earth, becoming a man, shedding his blood, dying on a cross, being buried, and rising again the third day. And, Father, that they would repent of their sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be born again. Father, open folks' eyes to that need. And, Lord, if there's anyone in this church right now that's not been genuinely born again by faith alone in Jesus Christ, my prayer is that they would get saved even this very day. Embrace Jesus Christ. Allow Him to be their substitute Turn from trusting in everything else except the finished work of Jesus Christ. And Father, help us who are saved to proclaim that message. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Please take your hymn books out and we will close in song. All right, let's open up to him 335. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Hymn 335. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and Child and 